right, hello everybody. Welcome to the CTL Summer Summit. Uh, I am Dr. Rebecca DuPont and I'm going to talk today and answer some common questions I get as far as the choices I make regarding classroom, technology, and learning management systems and the big, why do I do it? So to go ahead and dive in and get started, one of the first questions I often get is, why Google? Why the Google Suite? To give you a little bit of background, in the video game industry, especially when we're dealing with indie game developers, a lot of us are looking for ways to cut costs. So instead of buying like the Microsoft Business Suite, you can get a lot done as far as the Google Suite just using the free version and having a Gmail account. Yes, Google does offer a bunch of business versions that you can buy into, etc. But if you're just starting out, you can very much get started with just the basic. Now, another thing too is, I don't know if a lot of folks have noticed this, but at least from a technology standpoint, I'm starting to see a lot of students because they're using things like Chromebooks in K through 12, these students already have Google accounts. They already use Gmail. They're already comfortable with the drive. So instead of having to worry about whether a student has taken, for instance, CIT 100, where they're introduced to the Office Suite, my students are able to dive right in. They know how to go through the collaboration process using Google. And we now nix kind of that issue of the learning curve so they can just start working simultaneously together. Also too, it makes my life a little bit easier because then they can just share things with me or add me as a collaborator that I can just hop in and grade their work accordingly. So in Blackboard, instead of them uploading, say, a PowerPoint presentation to me, if they're doing a Google Slide presentation, what they're uploading is the URL that I just click on. It opens right in my browser. I can see what they all did, their workflow, and I can give them a grade that way. Also, too, as far as Google versus the Office Suite, it's also for me, it's just personal pref. I am not a fan of Microsoft, has how they organize things. I don't like how their OneDrive works. Now, I'm sure there are plenty of people out there that think OneDrive is wonderful. It does everything that it's supposed to do. I'm just not a fan. I also don't have the issues with Google Drive where, for instance, when you're using Microsoft Office 365 on the web, where I've now lost a lot of the capabilities that I am aware of with the desktop versions of the Office Suite, Google's uh, slides, their docs, and you know sheets, I already know what I'm getting. Also, too, I can export them as a PPTX or a DOCX or you know uh, an Excel spreadsheet. It doesn't matter. So I can get a lot done that way. Following up on that, though, tying into the Google Drive, I also get a lot of questions. You know, for instance. Uh, like if I show you here, as far as a Google Sheet is concerned, a lot of people will present the argument to me that, well, this isn't as powerful as Excel. Okay, you know what, that's actually a fair argument here, but my question to you is, what type of data are you looking at? What type of data are you analyzing? At least for indie game companies in the level of statistics that I do, I don't need the heavy hitting statistics. I'm pretty much sticking with, you know, mean, median, mode, t-tests, etc. I don't need ENCOVAs and MANCOVAs every day that I'm working. And oftentimes too, a lot of my spreadsheets are more from organizing and trying to time out in, you know, in the department head case, what time are my classes and when in comparison to everybody else's classes? So the spreadsheet gets the job done here. So you do have options as far as still being able to validate. Also too though, there are a lot of online sources. So for instance here, as far as a database goes, they're now starting to add in as far as being able to connect to databases. Sheets is very much catching up. You know, so you also can directly link it to forms. So I will be curious in the next few years to see where Google Sheets gets. So that was always the first question I got. So as you saw, another question I often get is, okay, this is nice, this is clean. How much extra work is this? If you're just starting out, 
it's a lot of extra work. I'm not going to lie to you. I can spend, especially when I'm getting a class off the ground and revving it for the first run through, I spend hours upon hours. However, having said that, it makes life a lot easier for me because then in the future when I'm teaching the course, in Blackboard, all of the links are already set up. So when I roll that course over, I can just jump into the Google Docs, maybe I change the due date, or if something changed, as it always does in the video game industry, I can just update the doc instead of having to take that extra step in Blackboard, for instance, and remove, add, and upload. It's already there. I can just go behind the scenes of Blackboard, edit it in the Google Doc or, you know, slides or whatever, and it's automatically updated in Blackboard for me. So I'm just deleting that extra step in there. Short term, that might not seem glamorous. Long term now that I've been doing this for several years, makes my life very much easier as far as trying to roll over my class. Because at least in multimedia, one of the big issues we run into is, yeah, you know, things change so much from semester to semester. I'm pretty much updating the course semester to semester. Also, I try things that I'll get feedback in the SOSOs that students are like, oh, I loved how you did this. Um, so now I'm trying to integrate that even more or, oh, I wish you would have had this included. Fine, I'll go ahead and add that in as well. So it is a lot of extra work. It's more of a front load working. Once you get everything in place, though, it makes life a heck of a lot easier in the long run because then you're just updating externally. Everything's already set up in Blackboard for you. So another question that I get is people will sit in on my presentations. Oh, look at all the stuff you're doing, Rebecca. What do I start with? You know, where can I begin? My advice is number one, pick one thing. As you might have noticed, especially on the Dive Into G Drive website, but also a lot of the videos I share with you, I mean, I'm all over the place. I'm doing audio, I'm doing graphics, I'm doing videos, I'm doing slides, I'm doing documents. Pick one thing that, and get good at that one thing. If not, you're gonna get super frustrated and you're gonna get burnt out. Again, I always tell my students that whenever they see me, you know, flying through a 3D model or flying through designing a game environment. I've been doing this now for almost 16, 17 years. You can't compare yourself to me if you're just starting out. So my advice would be, you know, practice one thing. So maybe you're like, you know what, I want to try this whole Google Drive connecting to Blackboard thing. Stop there. That's it. For this semester, make that your goal. Yes, it might look so cool, like, and you might have these big ideas of, oh, you know, these videos would be great, and hosting them on YouTube versus Panopto might be great, or, oh, I love the idea of a podcast. Pull it back. Just work on getting your links correct between whatever Google Doc or slides or sheet you are using and get it connected to Blackboard. Then maybe over the summer, explore creating a podcast, making your own episodes. And that actually is kind of a good follow up as far as um, I also often get, well, why do you use things like YouTube versus say Panopto? You know, we have Panopto, we can embed it directly into uh, Blackboard. One of the reasons is, is I am very, very big on Creative Commons. So when I'm working with Panopto, having to go through, try to download the video, upload it to YouTube, it's just all these extra steps I don't want to deal with. I am also very comfortable with Adobe Premiere as far as being able to just record my videos and edit my videos. For example, there are software pieces out there that you can use. One of the last things I'm going to be adding to the Dive into D Drive here is actually recording your screen. Open Broadcaster software, or OBS as we call it for short, is probably one of the biggest open source screen recording software packages out there, as in you don't pay anything. However, it can be a little bit intimidating. Like if I actually take a time out here in my talk, and I'll show you here, 
right now this is what OBS looks like. So it's actually recording my screen. I had to set it so that I have the video down and I also had to position my video in the lower right corner here so that you could see me talking. But this is an example of OBS. I was introduced to OBS just from game streaming. Uh, we use it heavily as far as Twitch TV and things along those lines whenever we're streaming uh, gameplay. However, as you can see, it has an excellent use as far as being able to record your desktop. So that's one of the options there. But it was something that I kind of had to sit down and use my prior experiences and fumble through. But because I now have the idea of it, it's I want to share this with the world for any other teachers that may be sitting there saying, I don't like the constraints of XYZ software I'm using in my institution. I want to use my own software and have a little bit more control. This would be where OBS comes in. And that's why I have my own YouTube channel. It's not meant to be glamorous. I don't do it to, you know, get a bunch of likes, get a bunch of followers or anything like that. I like it from the embedding standpoint, but that I can actually share and mark the content as far as being able to be shared. Like to give you a for instance here, I just finished up Audacity basic editing and importing here. So you can see I can add all that information in there. You can choose if it's public, things like that. I can also track the analytics. You can even come back in here and I'll show you under the details here. Let's see if I can get to show more. A couple of big things is right here under the license, all of my videos are Creative Commons. That was probably a very frustrating thing in my field was Whenever, you know, virtual reality hit, augmented reality hit, working with all of these game engines and Maya 3D modeling, Adobe always constantly updating on us, we can't keep up with it. And I got to the point of, I should be sharing this with all teachers of the world. It stinks going it alone. So that's one of the big reasons that I use YouTube over Panopto. I want everybody to have access to my content. They can edit it. They can put it in their learning management systems. I don't care what you do with it. If it gives you a starting point and saves you a little bit of time, high five. That's a good thing. So, but that's also something because I have the YouTube or the Gmail account, YouTube is part of Gmail and the Google suite. So it kind of made sense to me that this is why I would use this. So again, coming back around to that question about, well, what do I do first? Again, pick a piece of one of the things I'm talking about on, you know, the dive into G drive website and just practice with that over time. It will come and you might actually find, you know, the only last bit of advice I'll give on this specific question is, if you were to take the, if you were then to follow up and ask me, well, what is the next step I should take? So I'm comfortable with G drive. I've added slides. I've done websites. Uh, even my students have done some blogs. What's next? In my opinion, and what I often tell my students in MMC 112 is starting with audio next is a lot easier just because you're not dealing with the video element of your design. So all you're worried about is the audio. So that would be my advice, but I've also seen people be successful that they just jump right into the video and they have no problems. So again, baby steps, take small bites, and really the sky's the limit on that part. So how much will this cost you? That's always a question I get. People think about, oh my gosh, I need to buy all this stuff. I need to buy lights. I need to buy mics. I need to, you know, do all of the things. And literally what I use everybody is, you see this headset I'm wearing? This was like a $30 headset. That's it. That's all I paid to get started doing this. I do shift into, if you watch some of my videos, I do change the tone of my voice uh, in comparison for those of you who have talked to me in real life. I very much shift my tone into my radio voice. But outside of that, uh, 
this is it. There are big name companies out there as far as mics go. I know there's uh, uh, something like Blue Yeti and things like that, that they're like desktops. Uh, you also see some folks where they're using those big lamps where, you know, the cylinder lights and the most I have is a den lamp and an overhead lamp and my window lights. I've never had my students complain about the way my presentations look. They're probably more concerned about the content than how it looks. I will say that most of your students are probably not expecting Lord of the Rings slash Avatar slash Star Wars style editing. So having said that, you can get started very easily. I mean, in fact, probably from a mic standpoint, if you only get a microphone, you know, diving into audio, you know, working with something like Audacity here, or even hopping into Anchor and getting started in Anchor by Spotify, you can get a ton done as far as just having a headset microphone. One of the next questions I often get also is relating to diversity, equity, and inclusion and usability as far as the web goes. Probably one of the more dangerous areas, although probably an easier step up, is uh, podcasting. Podcasts, or specifically the episodes in podcasts, you often will need to take into consideration actually having some sort of written recording as far as the actual recording because as you know for those of you who are for those who are hearing impaired uh, a podcast is probably the worst thing that you could use for them now there are transcribers as far as creating close captioning for uh, podcast episodes however that is an area that yes they will charge you money and normally on average the last time i checked it's 25 to 50 cents per minute of audio for the transcriber to go through that having said that could you technically do it yourself yes there are ways with podcasts that you could go through transcribe your own episode and then upload that you want to go back and talk about you know how much extra work is this that's an example of extra work i don't even do that there are ways in Anchor that you can set up for closed captioning. Another thing too is, okay, the other side of that is the YouTube videos. That is actually something though, another reason that I really favor YouTube is their closed captioning algorithm is fantastic. So long as you speak clearly into the microphone, I would even say I over enunciate whenever I am doing videos, I don't think I have ever had a video where YouTube did not recognize what I was actually saying, where it misprinted something. And that's just set here under the show more section. I make a note that this content has never aired on television. I think what that does is it adds one extra step in like the scan process of the video, but otherwise YouTube does all the heavy lifting for you on that front. So, and there's no extra charge for it. So it just puts it on there for you and it's all good. I am rusty enough with Panopto that I'm not familiar with its closed captioning capabilities, but I will say this, speaking as somebody who needs both the text and to hear simultaneously, whenever I'm in a class or I'm learning something, closed captioning is absolutely clutch across the board. And honestly, so many of these self-contained programs just make it so easy for you to do that. There's zero reason you shouldn't be integrating that into your videos and audio pieces. So absolutely, you have the tools to be able to address the DEI type of information there. Another nice thing too, as far as equity is, you know, 
we at CCAC, we offer students as far as getting laptops and things like that, but a lot of these audio and video elements, they can also be viewed directly on cell phones if students have those, and, or if they're using a library, they will be able to access these multimedia items. So it's definitely something that we can still kind of be very inclusive on. So with that, um, the last question I always get to is, um, in my opinion, what is, you know, the hardest thing to do? The hardest things to do are to learn good habits when you are working with recordings or you are having to edit recordings. So often I see folks that will want to start out with video and audio and let's say you mess up or misspeak. I have seen people get super frustrated and they hit the stop button and it's like, oh, I gotta start all over again. It takes a little bit of time, but being able to get into that habit of just pause and then start speaking again. Give yourself that gap and just start over again. That way you're not losing the original track piece. Because remember, you now have these software packages that you can go in and you can edit out your mistakes. In fact, whenever I get ready to edit this video here, I think I've made about you know six or seven mistakes. And hopefully, once I do the editing, you're not gonna be able to tell where my mistakes were. So I just paused and then I went back, cleaned it up, cut out the errors and continued on with the video. So that hopefully gives you a little bit of food for thought as far as some of the things that you can do and kind of getting into the saddle of adding all of these multimedia elements into your classroom. It can make a little bit more work on our side as far as being uh, the teacher is concerned. However, it can make for such a much more robust experience for our students as far as what they're used to, as far as having interactive elements, being able to go in and, you know, actually see demonstrations, digestible pieces of information, etc. So I hope you all enjoyed. Uh, enjoy the rest of the CTL Summit. And if you have any questions, shoot me an email.